uh, next up we have uh, Daniel Buchner, who is uh, the head of decentralized identity at Microsoft, who's going to talk about ION, uh, scalable decentralized identifiers on Bitcoin. So, um, and also apparently he's very bullish on Bitcoin. <laughs> Hey there, everyone. Um, yeah, so Daniel Buckner, I work at Microsoft on decentralized identity, uh, specifically really the standards and open source side of it, which is a lot of our work. Um, I'm gonna talk today a little bit about decentralized identity in general, you know, why identity matters, and then specifically about something called ION, this, uh, this layer two network and protocol we've been helping to contribute to that runs on Bitcoin to uh, create decentralized identifiers at scale. And then I'll end with a little bit about where we're going next and how it kind of affects the application and service landscape. So what is identity is really the first question. Um, identity is all around you. So your identity is everything you, you say, do, you think, you experience and express and across you know, apps and services, uh, what you tweet, everything. It's all part of your identity. And you know, I posit to you that every living and non-living thing has a single identity, right? It's who you are in the world, your imprint sort of on the universe, but infinite personas. So you can project contextually uh, your identity in faceted ways. Like you're not gonna present yourself the exact same way with every single person or every single entity that you engage with. So personas are like you sharing a part of your identity. Um, identity really is the most, you know, is foundational to every digital interaction in the world. So everything you do, even though you don't regard it potentially as an identity transaction, is essentially an encoded identity transaction. So to give you some examples uh, of why I believe identity is a must win fight, um, just like you would say, you know, hard money or decentralized money is a must win fight, is because it touches everything in your life. Um, from social media, sharing your ideas and your thoughts and your beliefs with the world, um, you know, messaging and communications, being able to privately and securely, you know, discuss things with people. And, and even, you know, the marketplace of, of uh, goods and services, being able to freely exchange with others. These are all really uh, underpinned by identity and without identity in many ways, it's very difficult to do these things. So the centralization of identity is, I would argue, just as important as the, the decentralization of money. So, Let's talk a little bit about what identity is. Um, you know, it's, it's a complex word. I think it, there's a lot that goes into it and people often conflate two really distinct things about identity together that shouldn't be. One, uh, there's the identity data. And I think people typically think of the identity data and identifiers as the same thing, identity, when they're really two different things. So to start at the root of the tree, there's identifiers, right? So the things you use to denote digital interactions, which today are you know, very centralized, like your email addresses or usernames in an app, think like Twitter. Um, identifiers are really the core of everything. You know, If your identifier isn't stable and yours, it's kind of hard for a lot of interactions to take place. Um, you know, we saw this recently with a social network that, you know, unfortunately, the identifiers on it are controlled, um, you know, outside of your control and were co-opted to be able to send out messages that weren't really from the identity um, that they represent. Um, and then there's identity data, which is beyond the identifier layer. That's all of the things in the world that you might associate with your identity from the public posts you do to, you know, your communications on instant messaging apps and all of those different things. But it really helps to distinguish the two and, and make sure you have them mentally separated. So I'll talk a little bit about the root of that tree and, and decentralizing that, that root piece, which is the identifier piece, the foundation. Um, we're working with many other companies, uh, open source companies, um, large cloud providers, small startups in the W3C and the Decentralized Identity Foundation um, on a specification called decentralized identifiers. So it's an emerging specification. We, we do hope that it's ratified in 2021. It's on track for that. Um, DIDs are essentially cryptographically um, self-owned identifiers. So you'll see in the example of this DID identifier, it doesn't look like an email address. You know, it's a, generally a large garbled string, um, but it is a string that is yours. And you can have many of these identifiers. It doesn't mean that everyone's just gonna have one identifier, but they're yours because they're backed with 
uh, this metadata, this PKI document, public key infrastructure metadata document that has public key references in it and some other things like service endpoints. And the way that you can prove through a DID based system that these are, you know, this is your ID is that provably this, this document that's full of public keys is associated with the ID in a way that is independently verifiable. So unlike today where, you know, certificate authorities and DNS domains are so, so essentially just, you know, bestowed upon you and, and related to you because, you know, a central authority ordains it, um, the DID based systems are able to, to give you identifiers that are wholly yours without the middleman um, that you can independently own, just like you could own your Bitcoin. Um, so robustly decentralized DID implementations, and there is a gradient to this. Some are more decentralized than others, and I'll talk about this. Uh, like ION, do a good job, we believe, at protecting against censorship, uh, tampering, and interdiction of your IDs, as we've seen with so many apps and services today. So let's talk a little bit about ION, this, this network um, and protocol that we've been working on. What is on it? ION is an open, public, permissionless layer two network that runs atop Bitcoin and adheres to the W3C decentralized identifier standard and is able to deliver decentralized identifiers at comparatively massive scale to anything like these sort of more centralized or um, on-chain L1 style protocols. Unlike other DID implementations, of which there are many, ION does not rely on trusted validators, centralized authorities, any additional consensus schemes beyond Bitcoin itself. And of course, it has no special utility tokens. We already have one of those. It's, it's called Microsoft's MS, MSFT if you want to buy it on um, any of the common exchanges. Um, so we, we don't need any of that, right? So we weren't primarily interested in this to make money. We see this as an enabling public utility layer that anyone should be able to run that should exist without us. And in fact, we have no signatory or centralized authority over. I like to say ION's a little spiritually sort of like lightning in the sense that is a protocol that anyone can, you know, run, right? You don't have to get Microsoft's permission or anyone else. It's, it's a, a logical and deterministic mathematically based protocol that happens to use Bitcoin as, a, as an oracle. So how does ION work from a you know the topology perspective? Well, this is a very you know obviously simplified diagram, but if you look at this and imagine there's two nodes in the ION network of which anyone can obviously run, an ION node contains this transaction writer component, the transaction processor, an IPFS node, and um, Bitcoin itself. Right? They all run in Bitcoin. So if you if you want to run an ION node and be trustless in resolving IDs and, and interfacing with other IDs, you're going to run Bitcoin. Um, in this diagram, node one could be anyone. We could we could run one as Microsoft. You could run one as Alice, who wants an ID. Anyone could run it, and you can anchor into Bitcoin from one DID operation, as we call them, which could be like creating a new ID or updating that PKI metadata document I talked about to rotate keys, something like that, all the way up to ten thousand operations. So there's this aggregation component in Ion. Um, now, Alice could go and anchor just one single operation into, a, into Bitcoin uh, by creating the requisite files, IPFS files, and encoding the proper CID into to Bitcoin. Um, but, you know, obviously there's a cost to that. So, you know, she'd be bearing the full cost of whatever that Bitcoin transaction is. So we believe that many users are going to opt to send their operations to other people who are running nodes at scale, like Microsoft and others. Now, I'll note that this isn't centralized because Alice always owns her keys and her operations are signed with her keys. So there's no way other than literally the node that you're sending your operations to dropping it on the floor um, that they can you know, manipulate your, your identifier operations. Um, and you can always check and you, you have receipts essentially to understand if it, if it made it in or not. So let's imagine Alice and Bob, they're gonna send their operations over to, to some node. The node gathers them together, creates a, an IPFS file, and embeds a CID into a Bitcoin transaction um, using the protocol to set up that transaction in the proper way. Node two here is, is always processing Bitcoin. It's always looking at Bitcoin and saying, okay, I'm looking for transactions inside the blockchain that are related to our protocol. Um, once it finds one, it extracts the CID, parses it, makes sure other aspects of the transaction were done correctly, and goes and uses IPFS's, um, you know, the libpp underlying layer to fetch the CID uh, uh, the data that corresponds with that batch and process it in accordance with the protocol. What this protocol essentially is, is a CRDT, a conflict-free re resolving data type, 
Um, you use them all the time. Anytime you do like collaborative document editing on um, you know, Google Docs or something, you're using a CRDT. Uh, what these systems are, they're, they're basically doing delta-based changes to something, right? to some state. In this case, say a Google document, right? And all those changes are compiled by a centralized entity, Google, and they're based on incrementing like the state over time. So there's a lot of trust involved because time is essentially of Bitcoin and uses Bitcoin as the uh, the vector clock oracle. So essentially, the sequence at which things uh, you know, are entered into Bitcoin is the only consensus that matters for ION. Everything else is purely deterministic and convergent. So what does ION deliver, right? You know, ION can process thousands of PKI operations per second as an L2, um, enabling DIDs for every person, org, and entity in the world, and doing so while running these nodes on common consumer hardware. Our target device right now is a 2017 Intel NUC, it's, you know, it's got a reasonable amount of storage and, and RAM. Uh, cost efficiency, so let's talk about it. You know, people freak out about Bitcoin fees. Um, every piece of data that you anchor in the blockchain is different. Data has different um, game theoretical, you know, perspective. There's different game theoretical, um, I would say, issues with different types of data, right? Like if I wanted to tell you as a person, hey, store my one terabyte of cat photos, you know, from some random person in North Dakota, you're gonna say, hey, that cost me a lot of money. I don't, I don't know if I wanna store some cat photos. Uh, if I said, hey, here's a terabyte of data, you can interface securely and in a centralized way with every other entity on the entire planet, you might say, wow, that's a terabyte. That's you know, a couple hundred bucks, I could do that. Um, so, so we believe that there is a cost, there, there is an impetus game theoretically for you know, storing and propagating uh, DID-based operation data. But even if Bitcoin fees spike to $100 per transaction, ION's able to aggregate up to 10,000 operations in a transaction. So each DID operation might be as little as one cent per operation, even at that rate. And I do want to stress that DID operations are not like frequent. It's not like when you log into a website, you're not like generating DID ops. DID ops are, are for when you might get a new phone, right? And you roll off the public key that was associated with the one phone with a new phone. So these are typically um, infrequent uh, activities. It's fle there's flexible nodes in ION. So there's actually a robust light node capability we're working on, which um, reduces the data required um, by about 95%. So you have like this full node that has like this whole cache world state. And then there's this proofing node where you can basically trustlessly get the same level of decentralization, but not have to store all of the data if you don't desire to. Um, and then it provides a decentralized registry, which I'll touch on here in a bit. Um, basically, ION's a crawlable list of IDs. Um, it's pseudonymous, so you don't know anything about them. All you know is like, here's an ID, here's this PKI document. So if I run into them, I could vet them. And I, I might, they might put a service endpoint in there so I could go talk over some you know, protocol to see if they'll talk to me. Um, and this paves the way for interdiction resistant registries, which we'll touch on. So what's ION's path, right? We started fleshing out the core concept in 2017. Uh, you know, we had a, a first spec draft and a testnet prototype in 2019. As some of you may have seen, we did a beta announcement where we started running uh, the current code of ION on Bitcoin mainnet. And we project that we should be in good shape to be able to do a final launch of V1 in quarter one, 2021. Uh, so what's the next phase? This is the fun part. Um, now, people don't typically think of identity as an application and service layer, but I'm going to argue to you that it is. Um, ION is just the first step. It's the identifier and routing layer for IDs. The next step is personal data stores. So that's the idea that I might put a service endpoint in my DID document that points to a, an encrypted personal data store uh, where I can transact with people. So if someone looks up my DID, they can find this personal data store, which is not some crazy blockchain thing. It's just you know an encrypted storage and relay server and send me messages and I can communicate with them and share data out to the world. So in this model, Alice and Bob link their DIDs to personal data stores. Alice can become aware of Bob's DID through any number of direct or indirect discovery methods. Um, Alice resolves Bob's DID to find the link to his personal data store. 
And then DID owners like Alice and Bob through this connection, this sort of you know, global state system can now publish data to anyone in real time. You know, not, it's not a blockchain, so it's real time you know, traditional hardware and software um, and securely exchange private data over a DID encrypted channel. And the cool part about this is this is all on the standards track. So you're going to be able to see this potentially integrated in browsers and other areas. It's not some one-off company or even just Microsoft doing this. This is a, this is a pretty significant standards effort. So what is the DID platform enable? I kind of want to open your eyes to this because I, I, I don't think it's well understood in, this, in the, the world today. Um, everything you see on this slide is an identity use case. Private messaging like Telegram and Signal. Uh, why do we have one-off apps that have their own protocols for sending encrypted messages? Uh, what if there's one universal layer for sending encrypted messages? What if I had a DID with keys and you could look up my personal data store, which is a standard, and you could send encrypted messages? And the apps that used to do so became essentially veneers to sending those messages. They all use the same underlying protocol. That's what we're going towards here. Social media. What, what if instead of following DIDs you follow, and centralized usernames, you follow DIDs instead, right? And we saw what happened on com, you know, this social media uh, site that we probably all use. Um, that stuff is not possible. That sort of interdiction, getting in between you and your messages, because those messages end up being signed by your DIDs in a decentralized system, and no one can lie about that, right? Um, gig service exchanges. We saw certain localities bounce Uber and Lyft um, out of you know those localities through regulation and stuff like that. Well, what happens when people can start communicating through their personal data store conduits, bids and asks and offers, and all sorts of other app-related data? What if they could connect more peer-based? What what are the who do you serve with your subpoena then? Who do you stop? Who do you who do you say to to not do commerce then? Well, you have to take it to a peer level, and and I'm I'm excited by that as a libertarian personally. Um, content registries. You know, right now we have apps on the App Store and code modules on NPM, and they're run by centralized entities. And we've seen what they can do. They can interdict you. They can take you out of the digital conversation. What if that isn't the case? What if you had an ID for an app, a DID, or a DID for your code module, and there was a central, a, a central decentralized registry like Ion, where no one could stop it, and no one could stop you from from being registered on it. So I'm going to leave you with a thought. What if the centralized identity was the actual real platform for dApps and people just don't realize it yet? I would argue that all of these crazy on-chain things that people have been trying to do, um, you know, in relation to like sort of application service traditional use cases are probably a pipe dream, probably aren't the optimal way to do this. And really decentralized identity is a better, stronger, just as secure and just as a centralized way of doing it. So think about that a little bit. Uh, mull it over and, and challenge yourself to potentially think in a different way. Um, that's all I had for today. I really, I'm really excited to be able to present to you. I'm excited for ION launching uh, in quarter one, 2021. Please check out the project. Everything's open source. It's not even under Microsoft. It's through Decentralized Identity Foundation, all, Apache 2, no patents. Come join us, work on it with us together. This is a community trying to drive standards and, and decentralized identity into the lives of people who need it. Thank you.